Welcome to episode 53 of the Glens for Punishment podcast, or GFP, a Toronto Maple Leafs and NHL podcast hosted by Michael Lapore and Anthony Bruno. He's Lapore. I'm Bruno. Thank you so much for listening and watching us on YouTube as well. We've been a little MIA recently, and since we did our last podcast, the Leafs went 4-3-1 and one over eight games but the GFP podcast is officially back. And we are recording this right after the Toronto Maple Leafs embarrassed themselves, losing 5-1 on home ice to the terrible Buffalo Sabres as minus 425 favorites playing in front of a capacity crowd for the first time in 81 days. So Lapore and I are both extremely fired up. <laughs> we are going to get into everything that has gone down with this team. We're going to give you our thoughts and opinions on a lot of things when it comes to the Toronto Maple Leafs. But Lepore, I mean, what did you think of that disaster of a game? Uh, we say it often that something is very, quote-unquote, Toronto Maple Leafs. That was very fucking Toronto Maple Leafs, man. First game in forever in front of a capacity crowd. Everyone's revved up. The Leafs are on a little streak. Buffalo's in town. It's all lined up for a win. And when that's the case with our beloved Leafs is when you bet against them because they are just the best in the world at doing what they're not supposed to do. But anyways, episode 53, as you mentioned, Anthony Bruno, shout out goes out to, remember this one, Bruno, Mike Koska, who oh I remember, goodness. that's a name, a good name, good name. Uh, I remember a lot of Leafs fans were, were pretty excited about this guy. He skated well. He was okay at moving the puck. But as time moved forward, the only thing he had going for him with his, was his hair because I remember the dude had some really good flow. But uh, Mike Koska added to the uh, tragic list of Leafs defensemen that we've had over the last two decades. Speaking of superstar players, Connor McDavid, Austin Matthews. We still have our Funko Pop giveaway going on. We hope to give these away or announce the winners, I should say, during our next show. And just as a reminder, if you'd like to get in on this contest, if you'd like to win a Connor McDavid or Austin Matthews Funko Pop, like this video, subscribe to the channel and comment down below with of the two players, who do you think will win the Stanley Cup first and why? Love it, Lapore. First of all, that Mike Koska throwback was unreal and it is funny because mm. the, uh, the one thing i do remember about him is his flow funny yeah. enough oh but yeah but another th big thing lapore this this funko pop contest giveaway we are so excited to give away these matthews and mcdavid funko pops and like you said lapore like the video subscribe to the channel and in the comment section down below let us know who's going to win the stanley cup first matthews or mcdavid and why and we are most likely going to give away these Funko Pops on the next episode so get those entries in immediately but Lapore, mm -hmm. we have to jump right into this disaster of a game we've already <laughs> talked about it off the top yeah. the Leafs lose 5-1 on home ice to the Buffalo Sabres Buffalo came into this game having lost six games in a row getting outscored 28 to 12 awesome and of course, they roll into Scotiabank Arena, capacity crowd, first time in 81 days, and beat the Leafs 5-1. to one. I mean, it's just the most on-brand thing possible. Like you said, when you expect the Leafs to do something, when everyone in the world expects them to do something, and I think everyone in the hockey universe expected them to win this game, that is when you do the exact opposite, and you let, literally bet everything you have on the other team. And that's yeah. what happened tonight, losing to Buffalo. Yeah, just terrible. I mean, you know it's bad when the first line that's been absolutely rolling is having a hard time getting good looks. I mean, they had some jump just because of their talent, but it just wasn't happening tonight. I thought the second line was pathetic. The, the one We always say, like, oh, what are you concerned about on this podcast? What, what scares you? That second line is fucking scaring me, Bruno. It's been bad. They, they look bad. It's not even one of those things where they're getting scoring chances and just hitting a lot of posts, not going in, getting goalied. 
they look bad. Like, I'm pretty sure I, if I remember correctly, th- that line did not have a shot on goal until the third period. And if I believe, if, I'm trying to think back, I think Tavares and Nylander both finished with one shot each. Like, that's terrible. That is absolutely pathetic. And going deeper into the lineup, man, I'm going to say it. And I think Leafs fans have been kind of scared to touch on this topic because they're kind of names that we love and you're not allowed to shit on them. But Wayne Simmons and Jason Spezza on that fourth line have not been good. Our fourth line has been outplayed game in, game out. And people can say, oh, whatever, it's the fourth line. But when you're a team who's looking forward to the playoffs and hopefully is going to make a run in the playoffs, you need performances from everywhere. And again, to touch on tonight, the first line wasn't good. The second line wasn't good. The fourth line wasn't good. So why not get some saves from your goalie? God forbid, right? Mrazik gets beaten for five like he always does. I mean, we should put it on a t-shirt. Mrazik gets beaten for five because it seems like it's a daily occurrence in Leafland. So just everything went wrong for the Leafs tonight. The only way to describe this game was pathetic. And I think it's hard to argue that this was not their worst effort of the season. I'm going to say it. I think it's right up there. I, I think back to that Pittsburgh game early in the season. Right. Where Pittsburgh was missing Crosby. Malkin, Latang, Jeff Carter. I think Brian Rust was out of the lineup too. And the Leafs got pumped. It yeah. was in Pittsburgh though, to be a little bit fair to the Leafs. It was still a disaster of a game. But tonight, I think it takes the cake, man. There have been a few embarrassing games this year, but this one is right up there. And you said it about that second line. I'm just looking at the box score right now. So Kerfoot, Nylander, and Tavares combined for three shots on goal. Kerfoot had zero, Nylander one, and Tavares had two shots on goal. There you go. So it's been a complete mess for that line. And it's like you said, it's not even like they're generating scoring chances. I know Nylander has shown some flashes recently, like even in the the Detroit game, that nice snipe that he had to open the scoring. And then even Tavares, who who made a couple nice plays in the Washington game. Everyone was talking about the assist the secondary assist he had on Rasmus Sandin's game winner. That was nice. But John Tavares has now gone 14 straight games without a goal. That's just unacceptable. I I don't care how many plays he's making. And if he made a nice assist on that game winning goal against Washington, this is an $11 million player, the captain of the team. You have to have a bigger impact on the game than not scoring in 14 consecutive games. That's Mm -hmm. just completely unacceptable. And you know, you're seeing it on a night-to-night basis here. It's like if that first line, the Matthews, Marner, and Bunting line is not firing on all cylinders and the Leafs aren't getting saves from their goaltender, it's been tough sledding. I'm actually I'm actually impressed, Lapore, with how well the team has played. Just zooming out and looking at the season, like coming into tonight, the Leafs were fifth in the league in points percentage. Mm-hmm. Despite their goaltending being awful, Heading yeah. into this game against Buffalo, the Leafs were 26th in the NHL in five-on-five save percentage. They're, they're the one good team that is that terrible this season when it comes to five-on-five save percentage. Like, you look at all the top teams, they all get good goaltending, especially at five-on-five, five for the most part. And then you see the Leafs, they're down there with, like, Seattle and New Jersey and Montreal and all these terrible teams. So it's almost insane that this team is where it is right now despite how awful Peter Mrazek has been who still has a save percentage under 900 after tonight it's I mean heading into tonight Mrazek's save percentage was as I pull it up here it's gotta be historically bad it was 895 heading into tonight so you can imagine it's probably at like 892 or something like that Jack Campbell over the last 20 games, an 893 save percentage. They're just not getting any saves at all. So unless they're putting four or five goals on the board, they can't, they can't win a game. Yeah. But they still are winning games. So it's like, I don't know, man. It's been a crazy stretch the last couple of months, and there have been a lot of concerns. But yeah, man, I mean, other than that second line and the goal, to, and you said the fourth line too, Spezza and Simmons, they have not been playing well. Is there anything else? that's been pissing you off about this team? (laughs) 
Uh, you just listed four or five things. Is there anything else that's been uh, pissing you off? Well, Bruno, like you said, you mentioned that save percentage uh, five on five and where they rank. I don't even want to know where they rank in the last, say, two or three months. It's got to be dead last or among the worst teams in the league. It's been absolutely terrible. But the, the thing is with Mirazik, man, is that, and I'm not letting him off the hook at all. So tonight's a good example. Four of the five goals were pretty weird. In the way that the first one went off Riley, I believe. Then there was a couple of ping pong ones. Then there was the Skinner uh, breakaway after a turnover when Sandine missed the pass. So if you look at each goal individually, there are goals that you would not typically point to your goalie and blame, blame him for conceding. But it seems like this is the case every game with Mrazek. Every game I watch him, no goal is really that awful. But... At the end of the night, he's let in four or five and under 30 shots. It's bad. It's bad. So it gets to a point where I'm going to say it, quote unquote, make a save. Make a save. For example, like Skinner beat him short side on that breakaway. It was three to one when that went in. We know the Leafs are the Leafs, then they can score for fun sometimes. One of those games, like we always say, I, was, I would put the Leafs at 50-50 to win the game and it was three to one. So Mrazik makes that save. Who knows what happens tonight? But no, he gets beat. Make a save. And people, like, this goalie issue is just everywhere. It's on social media. It's on the networks. I'm terrified, man. I'm absolutely terrified because it's not even as if, okay, the goaltending has been average. You can't make a deep run with average goaltending. No, the goaltending has been absolutely terrible. Terrible. And I don't see goaltending like I see other positions. The big topic of the Leafs going to the playoffs was always their defense. And, oh, track meets, you can't do that in the playoffs. It is possible to win in a track meet. Not every game, but when you're scoring it well, these high-scoring, uh, free-flowing games, game in, game out, you can win. You can win games. Now, I'm not going to say you're going to win the Stanley Cup, but you can win games, you can beat good teams. The way this goaltending is playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs right now, you can't win games. You can't, at least in the playoffs anyway. You can't allow five goals on under 30 shots and expect to win, get out of the first round. So I'm terrified, man. I'm absolutely terrified because it's a slap right in the face. It's, it's a direct point. Typically with these things, there are debates oh, the Leafs need this, or they should add this, or this guy's got to go. But then there's another side saying, yeah, but there's no yeah, but with this. There is no yeah, but with this. The only discussion to be had is what do they do? What do they do? They got, what, 30 games to figure this out or acquire someone? And when it started teetering, I would have thought you were crazy if you pointed out to the possibility of the Leafs maybe trading for a goalie, but it's going to get to a point and we have what, like three weeks before the deadline. If this keeps going, Dubas may have to do something. It's impossible because he can look at it and be like, nothing. I'll put it this way. Nothing else matters. If the, if the team was perfect, absolutely perfect, but getting this goaltending. No, it doesn't matter. They're going to lose. It doesn't matter how well you play. When your goalies are allowing three, four, five goals a night, you're, you're not going to win it, especially in the playoffs. And looking at Peter Mrazek's numbers, Lepore, you mentioned it. He has played 14 games this season, and he has allowed three or more goals in nine of the 14 games. That's 14 starts? Not 14 starts. I believe it's 12 starts. Okay. But yeah, he's allowed three or more in 14 games this season awesome. like th that's just unacceptable he's having one of the worst seasons of his career jack campbell the last three months going back to january or december 1st i should say i've been tracking his numbers i already brought it up 893 save percentage and a 3.35 goals against average over his last 20 games since december the first this team isn't going to win shit in the playoffs if they're getting goaltending like this you've brought this up on the podcast recently lapore you have Andre Vasilevsky. Now, I know Florida doesn't have the greatest goaltending 
but they do have Sergei Bobrovsky, who's a two-time Vesna winner, and he's kind of regained his form this season compared to the last couple of seasons. Do you trust Campbell or Morazic over Vasilevsky or Bobrovsky in a playoff series, or even the goaltending that Boston's getting from Jeremy Swayman? Now that Tuka Rask is retired, Swayman's been excellent. They have Linus Olmark as well. I would take those two goalies any day over. Yeah, Campbell we take and anyone Morazic right now. We take any, there's no goalie in the East on any team that's going to make the playoffs that we wouldn't take right now. It's ridiculous. That, that's a fair point. It, it really is. And I, I look back at the Austin Matthews era. This is the worst goaltending they have gotten in the Matthews. Let's call it the Matthews, Marner, and Nylander era since yeah. all those rookies came in together. And I know Freddie Anderson was here for the majority of that time. The goaltending was never this bad. Never. As much as everyone hated on Freddie Anderson as many soft goals as he let in in the playoffs and big games against Boston and Columbus and go down the list. The goaltending has never been as awful as we are seeing it right now. And I don't know how they get out of it because going into the season, I don't think Kyle Dubas thought for a split second that he was going to have to address this goaltending situation at the trade deadline. But it has now gotten to the point where he's looking at this team and saying, holy shit, we are a top five to six team in the league based on record, based on literally every metric except goaltending. He's like, do I really have to go out and, and acquire a goaltender right now? Do I really need to acquire a goaltender after I just paid Peter Morazic, which is looking like an awful contract, three years, $3.8 million a season. Jack Campbell, who's an unrestricted free agent at the end of the season who looked like he was going to be the number one after having an incredible year last year, coming flying out of the gates this season, looking like a, a top Besna candidate. And now it's all come crashing down. It really has. It's time for a quick break for a word about Manscaped, the champions of below the waist grooming and our proud sponsors who have done it again with the launch of the brand new ultra premium collection from trimming your hockey pucks to your everyday grooming and hygiene routine, Manscaped is here. After lighting the lamp, hit the showers with this all-in-one skin and hair care kit that covers you from head to toe. Manscaped is trust below the waist, and now it's time to trust them with the rest. Join the 4 million men worldwide who use Manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping with the promo code GFP20. Lapore, these products are the best. They are the best, Anthony Bruno. I'm sure a lot of our listeners are hockey players, and we all spend time in the locker room. Nobody wants to look like an ape, guys, in the locker room. So get that lawnmower 4.0, take it to your body, finish it up with the shampoo and conditioner and the body wash so you look great and you smell great. You said it, Lepore. You want to look good and feel good when you're playing hockey. So you play good. Very important. All right, everybody, get 20% off and free shipping with the promo code GFP20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping using the promo code GFP20 at manscaped.com. Don't be a goon. Upgrade your hygiene routine with the ultra premium collection from Manscaped. He's cost himself a lot of money, Campbell. I mean, I don't even know what that negotiation is like now or as it stands now, but if we could all announce what we really wanted from this, it would be Campbell takes the reins. Campbell gets comfortable again. He gets confident again. And I'm not saying we have to get to a point where he was at the point that he was at earlier in the season, because I mean, those numbers were bananas and they weren't at all sustainable, but if he can gain his con, we want him to get his confidence back, get to at least a, de a decently high level. What's the meter of like fear that you have with that being a possibility? Because again, I'm terrified. He see, and you don't again, we don't know these guys personally, but Campbell seems like an emotional guy. This has been a roller coaster for him. How well he was playing, how much people were pumping his tires, con talk of a Vezina trophy, talk of this big contract. And now it's all come crashing down hard, hard. So for me anyway, like what I've assumed and people comment down below or Bruno, what's your opinion? 
I think for him anyway, it's between the ears. He's just not confident in the net. His body language sucks. When that goal beat him against Detroit off the left wing, that's a horrible goal. Like, that's not an NHL goal by any stretch of the imagination. Oh, some of the goals he was letting in in that Detroit game. Like, you know, people love to shit on the Leafs defense and say there's all these defensive breakdowns and odd man rushes. No, going back to that Detroit game, pucks were being thrown on net from anywhere and going in. It was abysmal to watch. Yeah. So, I don't know. What do you think? Like, can he snap out of this? Do you expect him to snap out of this? Well, I'm with you. I'm extremely concerned because I think a lot of it is mental at this point with Jack Campbell. And again, I don't know Jack Campbell personally. I'm judging this based on, you know, the fact that he wears his heart on his sleeve, that he's the first one to put the blame on himself when he's talking to the media, specifically in post-game press conferences when he's coming off a rough game. He throws all the blame on, him, on, him, on himself. He has, you know, huge expectations for himself. But at the same time, he's also, he's a little bit too hard on himself. I mean, he blames himself for everything. Like, can you imagine how he's feeling right now? He thinks that he is the main reason that this team isn't, you know, better than it is. And, and again, the team is still really good. They're comfortably in a playoff spot. They're obviously going to coast into the playoffs, barring an absolute 18-wheeler falling off the cliff. But I think Jack Campbell is sitting there thinking that he's the the guy holding this team back, that he's the anchor, so to speak, and that if he were to return to the form that we saw at the beginning of the season or even going back to last season, that this team would probably be in the running for the president's trophy. And what's funny is that they're still in the running for the president's trophy. I don't think they're going to finish with the top record in the regular season, but you can imagine if this team was getting average to slightly above average goaltending specifically at five on five. I mean, imagine where this team would be right now. They probably would be the best team in the NHL. And I look at a quote today from Sheldon Keefe, Oh no. On, and they showed this on the on the Sabres Leafs broadcast. He was talking about why Morazic got back to back starts. And Keith said he's earned it. It's no secret Jack has stumbled as of late. And we have been talking about getting Peter more time at net. We think with the timing, everything just really made sense. And even going back to the last game against Washington, I believe Keith said that Jack just needed to get his head right. It's, yeah, I saw that one. <laughs> Right. And then I I even saw a quote from Campbell where he said that he took like he went on a walk like with his teammates and he was getting fresh air and he had to get his mind off things. Fuck me. So it's like you said, man, it just seems like a guy who it's a very man. It's a very tough situation right now because I think a lot of it is between the ears. And again, it's not like we're, you know, psychologists or anything like that. And we can you know, figure out what's going on in this guy's head. But I mean, just based on the way that he conducts himself in the public, I I would imagine. And I think most people feel the same way that this dude has completely lost his confidence and there isn't a lot of time to get that confidence back, man. These playoffs are going to be here in the blink of an eye. There's less than 30 games to go. And if you cannot get your shit together as a team and as a goaltending tandem, then I don't see how this team has any chance in a seven-game playoff series when their goalies are putting up an 895 save percentage. You know, you know what's so hilarious? Again, Toronto Maple Leafs, man. Imagine someone had not watched our podcast or the Leafs all season and then listened to this conversation we're having. But then you pointed out this team's on pace for between 110 and 115 points. How is that possible? How is that possible? We are having the best season in the history of the franchise, and we're all fucking terrified because our goalies cannot make a save. How? How? Oh, that's crazy. This has to be like I'd lo- I'd love to see the numbers of let's say we do acquire a goalie or go after a goalie in the history of the league in the history of the trade deadline. Has a team had a pace of 110 plus points? And been looking for a goalie? You think, no, that, that was short up. But no, no. Toronto Maple Leafs. That's why we have a podcast. And it's so easy to fill it all the time. But unbelievable. Unbelievable. Just Jack, figure it out, man. Figure it out. 
I, I hate to say this stuff, but this is why the sports psychologist gets gets paid, man. A lot of money. And MLSE's got deep pockets. That's where you need to put your pockets right now. Because the last thing this fan base needs and this organization needs is a first round exit because of something so simply black and white as a goaltending issue, a serious and obvious goaltending issue. Please, like, figure this out. Come on. You nailed it, man. The Leafs right now, Lapore, they are on pace for 112 points. They That's are after on pace. the loss tonight. Yeah, this, despite the loss tonight, still on yeah. pace for 112 points. They are on pace to shatter the franchise record by seven points, <laughs> which was set in 2018 at 105 points. And they're oh getting God. the worst goaltending of this entire Matthews and Marner era. And there's still in the league. It, it's insane. It, it's crazy to think where this team would be right now with average to slightly above average goaltending. But you said it, man. They got to figure it out, specifically Jack Campbell, because no one's coming in to save this team. I don't mm -hmm. think at least... In net, I don't. I don't see Kyle Dubas going out, and you know Mark Andre Fleury's name has been floated around. Come on, give me a break. I don't think they're going to unload assets and and try to bring in a Mark Andre Fleury. I mean, I don't know. Maybe maybe Dubas has completely given up on the goaltending at this point and and takes a big swing. But I think that they're going to look to improve the team in other ways. And maybe now we should start talking about the upcoming trade deadline. Yeah, and what this team should actually do, Lapore. Because, you know, we just talked about the goaltending for the last 20 minutes and how awful it's been. But on the Sabres Leafs broadcast, Sportsnet's Elliot Friedman reported that the Leafs could be looking at Anaheim defenseman Hampus Lindholm as a mm. possible option on the back end. Um, so the question I'll ask you, Lepore, is what do you think this team actually needs at the deadline? Like, besides goaltending which again, we just talked about and we could probably talk about for the next three hours if we wanted to, but outside of goaltending, what move do you think this team should make? The trade deadline is always an interesting topic because you want your team to get better. It's black and white. When you're a contending team, you want them to make a deal that gives you a better chance to make a run. But I'm kind of old school, and I've, I have no reason for thinking this other than just historical bias and confirmation bias, that it always seems the teams that make almost, I don't, I don't say the biggest splash, but the, the big name, the teams that seem to go after the biggest name on the board and acquire that name never seem to do it. They usually back to previous years where, I mean, Hosa or... I mean, there's that year. I mean, Kovalchuk, they made a run in New Jersey and then they signed him, but again, they didn't win. And I, I just look back to these times and the, these big splashes teams make, they don't seem to be the team to get it done. Like, so this time around, Claude Giroux, everyone's talking about Claude Giroux. And it's just like, I, I wouldn't touch that because if you're already an elite team, it just makes things different. It's too dramatic of a change to your lineup and your team. So, I all, I'm always looking for that nice move. The move that addresses a need, adds some depth. And that's what I'm hoping the Leafs do. What I'd like to see is a middle six uh, forward who maybe we can put on a line with Nylander and Tavares. And there's been names floating around like Hagel and Chicago is on an amazing contract. He'd be a great pickup, but who knows what they'd have to give up to get him. And something on defense just for depth because as happy as I've been with the play of Sandine and Lilligren, I don't know if I trust them on a playoff run. We, we saw you like Sandine had a, had, he scored tonight, but he had, he had a rough one. Yeah. He, he wasn't good tonight in the, in the defensive end specifically. He was just yeah. getting pushed off the puck. Mm -hmm. I mean, couldn't, I mean that the pass that Riley threw across him, it was a bad pass, but, you know, he struggled there and he couldn't clear the puck in front of the net. It, it was a bad game for Sandy. Yeah, he still needs to mature physically. He gets beaten the corners. He gets beaten down low. He gets beaten off the puck. So again, like, like I like the player and I think he'll develop into a very good player. But I would like some responsibility 
to be taken away from them. And then there's also the issue of, we don't know if we're going to see Muzzin for the rest of the season. And can Justin Hall be trusted? Oh God. Yeah. So for me, it's a middle six forward, nothing too fancy and a solid defenseman. And maybe one more bottom end defenseman for depth. That's what I'm looking for. So I don't know, like we can go over the names. Um, I've tried my best <laughs> to avoid those list of names because those deals never seem to happen. I've always said what I'd like to do is as the trade deadline approaches, write down every deal and every name that Sportsnet and TSN say could very well happen and then see the ones that actually happen. It's got to be like 5% or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it seems like every week one of the – you know, big hockey insiders comes out with another name that the Leafs are targeting. And mm-hmm. it just changes on a week to week basis. There's been like seven different names. At one point I heard Travis Konechny on the flyers, even getting tossed out there. Then on the broadcast for the Sabres Leafs, like I said, Friedman brings up Hampus Lindholm. And then you're hearing Claude Giroux. And then, you know, you're hearing Mark Andre Fleury and net what I don't want the Leafs to do is do something like they did last season where they spent a first and two fourth round picks on essentially a plug. I mean, I don't want to be too harsh on Nick Felino, but to give up a fourth, two fourths and a first round pick for a guy like Nick Felino is just not very good business. So if they're going to acquire a forward, I think they took, they should take a pretty big swing. And I'm not saying to bring in Claude Giroux. I mean, Claude Giroux, you know, he's obviously, not what he used to be when he used to be literally like an MVP caliber player six, seven years ago. But, you know, he still has gas left in the tank. He's still a very capable offensive player. And especially if you put him, you know, with either Tavares and Nylander or Matthews and Marner for that matter. But I don't think that Matthews Marner bunting line is getting broken up anytime soon. So ideally, like you mentioned, you want someone to replace Kerfoot on the second line And it would be nice because then you can move Kerfoot down the lineup in a role that he's probably more suited to play, Mm -hmm. you know, and Kerfoot, Kerfoot can do it all. He can kill penalties. He can play on the second power play unit. He can play on your third line. He can obviously play in the top six, but it would be nice to see Kerfoot move down the lineup. So I would like them to, to pick up a dude in the top six who can put the puck in the net. Again, I don't know who that name is. And I think it's almost worthless to, to guess and throw out random names and maybe that would get our podcast more clicks if we're just yeah i was gonna out. say is not the idea here i was gonna throw out jt miller while we were at it but yeah that was another name jt miller he's another guy that's been floating around right because obviously vancouver's in kind of no man's land yeah. having another disappointing season even though they've picked it up under bruce boudreau and elias Pettersson looks rejuvenated he's been really good recently But now everyone's like, oh, they should trade JT Miller and get some assets back and, you know, kind of retool the roster. That's another guy. That would be like a perfect fit in the top six for the Leafs, JT Miller. But Mm. I mean, oh my God, what do you have to give up to get a guy like JT Miller? This guy's been phenomenal this season. Did you hear the, did you see the name going around Twitter? Start, I think yesterday creeped in in the today. Max Domi. Yes. That's another guy I've seen floating Why? around. I don't At know that what this, what's this fascination. I get it. Ty Domi, fan favorite for a decade here. But why the hell is everyone obsessed with Max Domi? I think I think the the you say like obsessed, like the, the obsession with Max Domi is because his father obviously played here, but looking back to those early Matthews era years that Max Domi scrappy player with some talent is, was exactly what they needed. So I think it all just kind of tied together in a beautiful bow that the last name, he'd look great in a Leafs Jersey. He's from Toronto. He would fit in with the young group. So I, I think there was all of that, but my vision of it was if he ever signed with Toronto, it would be a la cheap. And then he signed that deal with Columbus. And I was like, how, how, how what? <laughs> for, for that amount of money, they can have him. So at his, cur- at his current salary, I don't know why the Leafs would chase that. Not at all. Because again, where would he fall in the lineup? Does, does Tavares, Nylander, Domi 
look that much better than Tavares, Nylander, no, Kerfoot? Not no. at all. That's, no, I don't think that's an upgrade whatsoever. No, like if they if they were to pick up a guy like Domi, it's for third or fourth line depth. And why would you have to trade what you probably have to trade because of the name? And that's the way the NHL works. And also because of the salary. He can sign for us next season a la cheap if he wants. Keep the, the GTA boy thing going. But no, 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 no. I don't want the Leafs to touch that one. And again, a player from Columbus playing for Columbus whose father played for the Toronto Maple Leafs. What could possibly go wrong? What, what could possibly po- go what wrong? What can possibly go wrong for the Toronto Maple Leafs? <laughs> oh, my God. We They'll could do, do an it. entire podcast on that. Yeah, they're going to do it. Oh, God. No, but I, I really do think that if the Leafs are going to make a move, I'm, I'm on the side where I think they should just go all in to a certain extent. And again, don't unload you know, everybody in the prospect pool don't give away all of your draft picks but i would go after a guy like jt miller because i think that would be a true difference maker and i hope that dubas learned his lesson last off season where he acquired nick felino and like i said gave up three draft picks including a first and got zero goals from nick felino in the regular season and playoffs and the guy was injured for basically half his leaps tenure so if they go after a jt miller i think that would be incredible but again you're gonna have to give up a sizable amount to, to, you know, to get a player like that. And then when you look at the back end, I was laughing at some of the takes that I saw about Ilya Labushkin when he was coming in. I don't know what on earth people thought the Leafs were getting in Ilya Labushkin. This is a, a third pairing defenseman who really can't do anything. I mean, he's a solid defenseman. He's not providing anything offensively. Sure. He throws his weight around and he's physical, but this guy's not moving the needle whatsoever. It was more of the Leafs just unloading that Nick Ritchie contract. I don't know why people can't believe they did. (laughs) Yeah, that was a miracle in itself. I don't know why people were even getting remotely excited about Ilya Labushkin. Maybe because Justin Hall at the time was playing terribly and same with Jake Muzzin. And Hall, you know, he was healthy scratch back-to-back games and then gets five points in two games against Washington and Detroit. Yeah, but again. Do you, do you trust that guy in the playoffs playing like 20 plus minutes a night? That's kind of scary. Mm. So ideally they can upgrade the blue line as well, but it's like, you know, if you're going to go after a guy like JT Miller, which I don't necessarily think is going to happen, but you know, it's nice to think about. And then what, then you're going to go after Hampus Lindholm as well, who can be a quality top four defenseman who can be like your fourth guy in your top four. I mean, what, the, what the hell are the Leafs going to do? Unload their entire prospect pool for these guys in, in a season where the goaltending sucks so it, it could all be it, it could all be for nothing yeah. you know as as harsh and dramatic as that might sound lapore they could make you know some big splashy moves at the deadline but if they're going into the first round and jack campbell and peter Mrazek have no confidence and they're allowing four goals a night you know I, I think back do you remember that series a few years ago between pittsburgh and philadelphia where With every Lurie game was like six five or seven six, like it was absurd. Yeah, like the goaltending was just egregious. Like I, I'm getting to the point now where I'm scared that that could happen. Where the Leafs legit are going to have to score five or six goals in a playoff game to win. Like yeah. it's it's crazy to think about, but that's what I'm saying. Like they could make all the moves they want, but if these goalies can't figure it out, then it might not even matter. As harsh as that sounds. Yeah, but specifically with the D, though, if we step back a second, Muzzin being hurt, Hall being Hall, Lilligren and Sandine still with some growth that's needed. Is there any way the Leafs don't make a deal for a defenseman? I think they do. I, I will say for sure they're going to yeah. acquire a defenseman. Yeah, now that for I think sure. about it. Yeah. But... I, I just don't know the caliber of player they're actually going to acquire. Like they might pick up another Labushkin, a guy who's like slightly better than Ilya Labushkin just to kind of, you know, for as an insurance policy almost, because like you said, enough. it's tough to trust Sandine and Lilligren to play, you know, big minutes in a playoff series at this point. Yeah. I don't know. Like, I'd like to see the names. Who, who are the guys? And like this is kind of a whole separate topic. But are there any guys who jump out in the lineup who you'd be more than willing to trade? 
if a possibility came up to make the team better? Honestly, I'd be open to trading almost anyone outside of the core four, Morgan Riley and TJ Brody. I mean, and maybe we we include obviously Michael Bunting in that, considering yeah. he's on one of the best contracts in the NHL right now on pace for 63 points, making under a million dollars a year, which is insane. Yeah. I'd be open to trading anyone. Honestly, Kasha I'd be open to would be tough too. Yeah, losing on losing good deals. exactly. He's he's been a real steady force on the third line with Kasha. But like I'd be even open to trading Muzzin. And I know that's Not a they hard have con- to. Yeah. Like that that's a dude I w- I'd be open to trading Muzzin, Hall, Dermot. And again, it's like, you know, I, I'm not wearing blue colored glasses here expecting to get an insane return for players like that. Like I, I know what I've been watching here. Jake Muzzin had any hasn't really even been this season. Even going back to last season, he honestly hasn't even really been that good. You know, mm. as physical as he is at times and he gives the Leafs that edge and the grit and the things we all like in the playoffs. He really hasn't been that great. And I don't think you're going to really get much in return if you unload some of these defensemen, but I'd really be open to trading a ton of guys on this roster at this point, because I think the most important thing is you keep your core together. You keep your stars together. You hope the goaltending can figure it out. And then if you can upgrade on defense, add in another top six forward, then you're really talking here. And again, this is a team that right now is a top five to seven team in the NHL. If they can just make a couple of tweaks, I mean, they could really beat anyone. The name that I would dangle with every phone call if I was Dubas and comment down below what people think about this is Lilligren. For some reason, I think you could get someone to overpay you for Lilligren to give you something really nice. The whole like young Swedish defenseman thing and he's got room to grow. And if you remove Lilligren from the lineup right now, I don't think you're losing much. No, you're not. So, and again, like, what's I like Lilligren. I've been rooting for him. He had a rough start to his career with mono and all that shit. But really, to the point now, like, what's his ceiling? What's his real and true ceiling? I mean, we hope he's an average, steady, just maybe slightly above average defenseman. So he's one of those names, man. First round pick, still an RFA. Swedish, for whatever that means. Still <laughs> young enough that a team might be like, ooh, we can really develop yeah. this guy and turn him into something. And he could be a member of our top four. Yeah, I think he's the years. I think he's the one. Like, I really think he's the one that you could get something decent for that'll make your team better. When, like, the names you mentioned before, like, certain guys, like, I mean, like, I'm with you. Like, I would trade trade almost anyone, but... Like Kerfoot, Mikheyev, like once you're getting to those guys, that changes things. Like those are still nice pieces to have in your depth. Guys who can get a big goal here and there. They kill penalties, do all that side stuff. But they, you have to replace them. Whereas Lilligren, I mean, you're replacing him if you get a player back their way, especially a defenseman. But it's not a thing. Like to the, the team doesn't get worse. Like they, they talk about in football – like a spread. And if you remove a certain player, how much of the spread changes the Leafs odds to win the Stanley cup, or even if you went round by round, wouldn't budge with Lilligren in or out of the lineup. So he's the guy, he's the guy for me that I, I I could see in a move. I really could. Interesting. Yeah. Because I I don't think Timothy Lilligren is moving the needle by any means. Whereas Rasmus Sandin, even though there are times where he gets pushed around defensively, he can be an absolute weapon when yeah. it comes to not only, you know, being a force in the offensive zone and being capable of running the power play, whether it's the first or second power play unit, even just moving the puck out of his own end. He's yeah. really good. Like, I mean, that dude, he can make plays that a lot of defensemen in this league can't make. And sure, there are times where he gets completely exposed defensively. But when you're talking about ceiling and you're comparing those two guys, Sandine just has a way higher ceiling, whereas Lilligren at this point, it's like you said, what, what is he really? I mean, is he really a top four defenseman? I don't know. Like, sure, he's a, he's a really solid player, but I don't think you're, you're missing much with him out of the lineup. Before, before we move on to the next topic, is there anything else you want to get off your chest about the Leafs and anything that they should do at the trade deadline? We vented a lot 
I, I just, again, I, I just don't want every, anything overly dramatic because I don't think that works. I just want that nice move for a second round pick or something in a prospect that makes you better. That makes you better. That little solid move. Because I, again, I, I'm not a fan of the big splash and people may argue against that, but I'm not that guy that's like, woo, let's get Claude Giroux. One name I'll throw out there <laughs> and a big name and he's number one on a lot of the list. And then we'll move on. Chikrin. Oh, I mean, that would be unreal, yeah. but I think you'd have to give up like at least Sandine or Lilligren. And then even this other defenseman in the system, Topi Niemela. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, you're going to have to give up some assets for a Chikrin, but he would be, he would be nice because he's just rotting away this season in Arizona. That team has been a mess and Chikrin hasn't had a good season, but I'm still very high on Jacob Trick Chikrin, who scored 18 goals last year and broke out Oof. and was like one of the best emerging young defensemen in the NHL. So even though he's having a bad season, don't forget how good that guy is. But that would be that would be awesome. Yeah. But Michael Lapore is against. He doesn't want Claude yeah. Giroux. I don't want JT Miller, any of these big names. And honestly, Mark Andre Fleury. Oh, Mark Andre Fleury, your favorite goaltender of all time. Oh, did you see that list that came out? Top ten goalies of all time. I'm sure you did. Yes. They put him at number. They, they put him in number ten. No Lundqvist on the list. No Carey Price on the list. Where am I with Mark Andre Fleury? Where that, that's am I? Case. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. How, how can you? And this whole other topic. Right off the bat, when Canada won the gold medal. In 2014, Carey Price was the goalie. Hands down, no argument. Marc Andre Fleury was not. I believe he was the third string. Yeah, Luongo so, was the second string goalie. There, there you go. So, how can you say like, oh man, like he he's top ten of all time? I, no. But anyways, Marc Andre Fleury. Yeah. I, I, you know what? I hope someone in the East makes a trade for Marc Andre Fleury. Because I'll be I'll be happy to face them, and so those words may may come in back and frown and light them up, light them up. These words might come back and punch me in the face, but I'm all here for it. Oh, I I would love to see your reaction if on deadline day the Leafs <laughs> make a splash out of nowhere to acquire Mark Andre Fleury. Yeah, Niemela need... first and Lilligren for Mark Andre Fleury. We are going to need a camera on Michael Lapore in the moment because that would just be glorious but tell tell you what tell you what i'm gonna say it on this show right now i will say it if mark andre Fleury ends up being a toronto maple leaf i will buy a jersey and we'll have a giveaway i like that i like that i'm gonna go. hold you to that lapore yeah so if anyone was hoping for it before now you're really hoping for it because i'll give away a jersey and and gfp nation is gonna hold you to that man they <laughs> yeah. want that that blue and white 29 Mark Andre Fleury jersey, man. Oh. Get ready. Oh. Man. But let's we'll, move we'll, on, Bruno. <laughs> yeah, let's move on because the deadline, like you said, is still a few weeks away. Who knows what the Leafs are up to? I'm sure Kyle Dubas is cooking some things up, whether it's a top six forward, a guy to solidify the decor, or even a goaltender, considering how terrible the goaltending has been. But we will talk more about that when the time comes. But Lepore, it is time to move in to our next topic. And Austin Matthews has been phenomenal this season. The last time we talked on this show, he was 9-1 to one to win the Hart Trophy. There was right. like three or four guys ahead of him on the betting board. But as of right now, to win the Hart Trophy, Connor McDavid is still number one, but Austin Matthews has gone from 9-1 to one to plus 375 to Ooh. win the heart. He is the second favorite. As we all know, last season, Connor McDavid led the league in scoring by 21 points. You know, there was no one else you were given the heart trophy to. Austin Matthews right now, there's been some buzz. And, you know, you can call it a hot take if you want. There's some people out there, and I'll see how Lepore feels about this, calling yeah. Austin Matthews right now the best player in the world is is that a hot take or is this or is this facts right now lapore is austin matthews the best player in the world right now okay that's exactly how i was going to address the question 
even only a few short months ago, I think had anyone said, or you, yeah, you can go back a few years, you can go back a few months. Had anyone said that Connor McDavid was not the best player in the league and said any name, that's a hot take. Yeah, that was a hot an idiot. You don't watch. Oh, that, that would have, that would have been a crazy hot take the way Matthews has played this season. And especially lately, the way he's scoring, the way he's dominated games, the way he's kind of transformed himself into a true 200 foot player. I'm not going to sit here and say that Austin Matthews is better than Connor McDavid. They're both crazy elite generational players who are very different. But I will say, I don't think it's any longer a hot take. If you ask someone if you were GM for a day of wherever your franchise was and you can make a trade for either Connor McDavid or Austin Matthews, if the person said Austin Matthews, I wouldn't yell at them. I'd say, mm, he's a pretty fucking good player, <laughs> this is, what, is what I would say. And he was, he was shit tonight. <laughs> so ironically, we're, we're talking about this. But I guess all the leaps are, were shit tonight. Maybe we'll let him off the hook. But it's fantastic, man. Fantastic. And if anyone was wondering why we such a gap in between shows, is because your boy Michael Lapore was on vacation in Florida. While in Florida, I attended a Florida Panthers game. Always a different experience attending a Florida Panthers game because, you know, the culture of the crowd, it is Florida. The crowd was decent, though, I will say. And they're a good team now. And I saw a game against the Edmonton Oilers. So I got to see McDavid and Dreisaitl live in the flesh. They're fucking good, man. Man, they are fucking good. Every time they enter the zone, they are a threat. And dry saddle reminds me of like in soccer when there's a number nine, they call it like that center forward who just he doesn't really do anything that jumps out, but he always just seems to score. To me, like that, that's dry saddle. And like he's gonna make he's physically gifted, he's got like a great, great build to him, and he's strong on the puck, but unbelievable player. And McDavid just comes flying in the zone all the time at 100 miles an hour. I don't even know what the hell defensemen are thinking when he's skating in on them. But all that being said, Austin Matthews looks great, man. So ugh, have the debate. I'll, I'll say that before it wasn't a debate, have the debate. The way I kind of see it is, and like the times and the careers are different, is when I, I'm sure Lane like Gretzky was Gretzky. And I'm sure there was a point where Lemieux was creeping up in that scoring race. There was a year he got 199 points where like it went from like Wayne Gretzky is the greatest player. If you don't think that you're an idiot to eh, you can argue for Mario Lemieux. There's an argue. There's a take for Mario Lemieux. And I think that's kind of where we're at with it now. You're not a dummy. If you think Austin Matthews is a better player than Connor McDavid. Yeah, you're not crazy at all, specifically right now in this moment in 2022, if you think right now that Austin Matthews is the best player in the world because on both sides of the puck, this guy's been an absolute monster. And my big thing with Matthews is that I know this season specifically, he's getting a lot of Selkie trophy buzz for his Here we go. for his two-way play. But one thing that I've always noticed about Matthews, and this is going back three, four years, I think people have totally slept on his ability to play defense and just his commitment to play a 200 foot game. How many times have you seen this dude go into a corner or come out of nowhere and lift a guy's stick and steal the puck? He's not been doing this just this season. And I know, you know, in that Minnesota game, he completely took over and he stole the puck for I, I forgot from who I forgot who it was on Minnesota steals the puck at the blue line comes in give and go scores the goal you know he was the reason they they beat Minnesota I believe it was three one on home ice two but goals, I've right? been watching yeah. this guy even throughout the Babcock era the things he is able to do whereas you know you look at a guy like Mitch Marner and he's a magician in his own way with his ability to make plays and set guys up and see things you know, two, three seconds before everybody else. Matthews obviously is the best goal scorer in the world, but I think that he's a, an absolute magician in his own way when it comes to coming out of nowhere and just taking the puck off of you and making 
you know, making a play where he's lifting your, even tonight against Buffalo, there was a play where the puck was centered in front of the net and he just came out of nowhere and lifted the guy's stick right in the slot to deny a scoring chance. It was like five minutes into the game, but that's always been my thing with Matthews is that I don't think he's gotten the proper, the proper love for how good he is defensively. And I think this season you're finally seeing it again. He wasn't like, you know, Patrice Bergeron defensively for the last four or five seasons. I'm not going to go that far, but this is a guy who I think has been really good on the defensive side of the puck for a lot longer than people realize. And I think just now you're seeing how good he is, because like I said, he's getting all this Selkie trophy buzz. He's on pace to score 60 goals. Again, he's on pace to have his greatest season from a point producing perspective. So Right now, man, it's really not a hot take at all. This dude is unbelievable. Every night, every time he's on the ice, except tonight, everyone was shit against the Buffalo Sabres. He's making things happen, and he's doing things that, honestly, only a handful of guys in the world are capable of doing. So right now, again, I I still think Connor McDavid is a better player. Yeah. Like I just think he's more explosive. <clears throat> he's probably the greatest skater with the puck. I've ever seen. He does things at the speed of light, an unbelievable playmaker. They're different players in their own way, but Austin Matthews, it's really hard to, to deny just how amazing he is. And honestly, right now, I think he should be the front runner to win the Hart Trophy this season, even oh, though he's second on the, on the betting board. There you go. So you're laying the bet then at plus 375. I mean, the, the bet was nine to one. A couple of weeks ago when we brought it up, I, I'd still probably bet on him at plus 375 because I think he should be the favorite at this point considering where the Leafs are right now despite how awful the goaltending has been. And when you look at Edmonton, that team is barely holding on to a playoff spot. They mm. just moved into a playoff spot with their win the other night. I, I can't remember who they, they beat the other night, but they were out of Philly. a playoff spot. Yeah, they beat Philly. Until they beat Philly. They shut them out, didn't they? Yeah, and Koskin and on fire. He's on that, that Florida game I was at. Oh my God. Edmonton had no business winning that game. Koskinen, who we shit on all this on this podcast all the time, was incredible. Unbelievable. Probably his best performance of his career. But yeah, like I'm I'm with you with the McDavid thing. The thing I always say is like, hey, well, what, what makes a player good? With McDavid, it's his speed. So if McDavid's having an off night, he's still fast. <laughs> And that's why I would say that speed in, in any sport is the most deadly weapon for that reason, because you have off nights, everyone has off nights, but if you're fast and you're having an off night, you're still fast. And that's not to say that, I mean, Austin Matthews in his, in his off nights is terrible and nothing's happening for him because his talents to a level where he's always at least semi dangerous. But like you said, the user word you use the right word with McDavid calling him explosive which just makes him so dangerous every time he enters the zone. So, and even too, like here, I'm going to like shit on Leafs fans a bit. A lot of Leafs fans are quick to point out five on five production, kind of like Matthews Marner versus dry McDavid. Does it matter? How, how much does it really matter? I mean, if a guy is like a power play magician, I mean, there's still goals. The, the, there's still points. And like, I'd be the first one to say that, yeah, five on five is more valuable, but at the end of the day, should we just be looking at like the total contribution or do you think the five on five thing really is that significant? Yeah. Cause that's the thing with McDavid and dry is that a lot of people say, Oh, they get so many points on the power play. It's almost like people dock them for how yeah. dominant they are on the power play. And listen, I get it. I think it is more valuable to be better at five on five. It just is, but we shouldn't be, docking points so to speak when it comes to mcdavid and dry saddle because they're so dominant on the power play i i, I don't yeah. think we could say well they get 38 percent of their points on the power play whereas matthews and marner only get 24 percent of their points on the power play meaning that matthews and marner are better because they're better at five on five so i, I don't think we can go that far because mcdavid and dry saddle, it's like you said they're getting points no matter what whether it's on the power play five on five and if they're going to be that much better than everybody else on the power play, then, you know, you just tip your hat to them. Because you, when that Oilers power play is buzzing, and I know the Leafs have the number one power play in the league right now, but when that Oilers power play is buzzing, and I have also watched them live in Edmonton, which right. we talked about, uh, you know, about a couple months ago, 
man, they are dangerous as hell on the power play. Like, it's scary, honestly. You think at any moment McDavid can make a cross ice or a backdoor pass to dry sidle and the puck's going in the net. So I think it's hard to pick. McDavid, dry sidle, Matthews, Marner. I mean, I think a lot of people would probably say, you guys are idiots, you're homers. Of course, it's McDavid and, and dry sidle, but I really do think it's a lot closer than people think. I just think the one thing that puts those two guys over the edge from an offensive standpoint, at least, is their power play production. And this season, you're seeing Matthews having a career year when it comes to points, and even Marner, for that matter, because the Leafs have been so good on the power play. Yeah. It's almost, it's almost and I've, I've been saying <clears throat> this for the last couple of years, it's like, just wait until Matthews actually scores more power play goals than, like, league average, because this dude's going to score, like, 65 goals the year that happens. And we saw it last season, and we're seeing it this season where he's on pace for 60 again because those power play numbers are ticking up a little bit. Yeah, there you go. I'm sure you saw that thing going around. If I'm not mistaken, mistaken, bunting has as many power play, or sorry, as many five-on-five goals and points as Dreisaitl and McDavid. <laughs> <laughs> so Leafs fans just ripping, and, ripping into it, eh? Just like, yeah, the great scoring race between the Leafs players and the Oilers players. And you look at it and it's bunting versus McDavid and dry Hilarious. Yeah. But again, that kind of shows it. It's like, yeah, everyone bunting's better than McDavid. Come on. Like Leafs, Leafs fans, right? Oh, we can, we can go all day comparing players on the Leafs and Oilers, comparing the teams, who's going to win the next playoff series first. We should actually dedicate an entire podcast to that because you know how much I love talking about the Edmonton Oilers. Who's going to win a Stanley Cup first? <laughs> there you go. Get those entries in for the Funko Pop contest giveaway. But Lepore, before we wrap up this podcast, is there anything else you want to get off your chest after this egregious 5-1 loss of the Buffalo Sabres and all the other things that we talked about over the past hour? Oh, man. After that game, after our vent session, Pretty exhausted. I think I'll uh, try my best to uh, get some sleep. But I'll just remind everyone one last time, this is your last chance. We're going to give them away next episode or announce the winners, as I should say. Connor McDavid, Austin Matthews. If you would like to get your hands on one of these Funko Pops, like this video, subscribe to the channel, and comment down below with the answer regarding who will win the Stanley Cup first between the two players and why get those entries in yeah come on guys we are very excited about giving away those two funko pops and it's gonna be great because we love giving stuff away here on the gfp podcast but the leafs looking at their upcoming schedule they have the canucks on saturday night at home it's soft and then they play at the Blue Jackets on Monday and at home against the Kraken on Tuesday. Yeah. Oh, and then right after that, Lapore, they got the Coyotes and the Sabres. Yeah, people were looking at the starting at the Sabres game tonight and talking about how this team could be in first place in 10 days. Because, I mean, totally capable of winning all of them. Well, you're 0-1, you're 0-1 boys. Wait, a good start. Way to go. And not just 0-1, probably the most embarrassing loss of the season. Yeah. So very, yeah. very leaf like. But yeah, man. that is going to do it, everybody, for episode 53 of the Gluttons for Punishment podcast or GFP, a Toronto Maple Leafs and NHL podcast hosted by Michael Lapore and Anthony Bruno. We would really appreciate it, especially if you enjoyed this episode, to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and ring the notification bell so you know exactly when the GFP podcast is dropping some new content. And we would love you even more if you gave us a five-star rating and review on both Apple and Spotify. That would make our day. But for Michael Lapore, I'm Anthony Bruno, and we will see you in the next one. Thanks, everyone.